while we've had quite a day today. Uh, this is Monday. I am recording after the shift I took after the picnic. I left you at the picnic at the house and uh, headed out to work, and uh, then I decided to come over to the church and record tonight just because of the, legit, the timings and everything. And this is my second recording because as I got out of the pulpit after recording the message, I noticed that the light on my mic was black. It was on before, but guess what? The battery died. This is the first time this has ever happened to me. It was green when I started. And it must have, while I was practicing getting ready, it must have run out enough, and I only got about halfway through the message, and I had, uh, and then I had no more sound. Uh, okay, so I'm going to do it again. So that was a practice round. It was brilliant. I, I have to say, it really was. Now, I'm not sure this one will be quite so good. All right, well, tonight we are in 1 Peter chapter 1. We are picking up where we were last time. And uh, I am, you know, I, I debate on how long to make these messages. And today I decided I'm going to try to go right through verse, uh, from verse 3 right through verse 5. And we'll see how we do on this. Now, when I practiced it, I got through. So you probably got a good chance we're going to make it. Anyhow, here we are in 1 Peter. So last time we were talking about blessed be God. We, we bless God because of the new birth that he gives us. And uh, the, the next few verses start with that foundation, and they're expanding on the results of the new birth. And so let's read the passage. And I'll, uh, I'm going to show you the results in just a minute, but let's read, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. All right, so let me just go over the three results of being born again. And then we'll expand on each one of them. So the first one, we are born again to a living hope. You see that there in verse 3. So a living hope is the first result. The second one is an imperishable inheritance. Born again to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable. Now it's not quite so clear in verse 5, the third one, because we have a different preposition in the English. Uh, it says... Uh, the born again comes from verse 3, but it says we are born again for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The word for there is literally the same word that we have in the previous two results. And so that we are born again for a salvation ready to be, to be revealed, or as I've called it, a salvation yet to come. So those are our three points, or the three topics that we're going to take. And in, re in reality, each of these topics could themselves occupy a single message, but I've decided not to take my time with these. I want, to, want you to see the structure of the passage, and I want to give you the whole passage as one. We're breaking it up enough as it is, because as you recall, verse 3 through verse 12 is one long sentence in Greek. Uh, and it is, uh, so, it, so there's a whole concept here. We're going to build on this. These three points, plus the fact that we're born again uh, uh, in the first part of verse 3, uh, are, the, are the building blocks of what comes next. And that's what we'll be working on in the coming weeks. So here's a proposition for tonight. The new birth grants believers three certain results. Three certain results. All right, so the result number one is the living hope. And so what I want to do is define that. And I want to sort of contrast two different kinds of hope. There's two words in the Old Testament that are used for hope. Uh, it's not quite the same concept as in the New Testament, the, in, in the word itself. It's not that they didn't know what hope was, but they, have, uh, they basically use the words for waiting. But there, one word in the Old Testament, I have this uh, statement from a reference book, the, verb, the one verb conveys a sense of waiting with expectation. You're pretty certain something's coming, I guess is the idea. And then the other verb may indicate a waiting 
for a period of time with or without expectation. So, for example, Noah waited seven days before sending the dove out from the ark the second and third time. See, that's this one word. He's waiting without an expectation. Doesn't know what he's going to get. Doesn't know that it's, he's going to get anything. But he waits seven days. He sends out the dove again. Uh, the dove comes back with nothing. He waits another seven days. He doesn't know what's going to happen. Sends the dove out again. You see, so he's waiting without expectation. But he says the hired worker waits for his wages with the expectation of receiving them. And that's mentioned in Job chapter 7. So there's an unexpectant wait, the hope for something to turn up, and the certain expectation. So it's, it's, uh, there's quite a difference there, quite a contrast. The living hope looks for something that is sure to come. I have in one of my illustration books a little saying, it supposedly comes from uh, the proverbial little boy who says, Hope is wishing for something you know ain't going to happen. You know, if you're a fan of certain sports teams, you hope they'll win, but you know it ain't going to happen. And uh, that's the way it's been for me for quite some time with uh, some of the teams that I follow. And uh, you just, you know, I mean, you're hoping they'll win, but there isn't much hope. <laughs> All right? But the biblical view of our hope is... Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of, glo of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. We know he's coming again. It's not that it is just something, well, you know, I hope he'll show up. Not sure. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. No, we know he's coming. That's one of the great things about salvation, and that belongs to us. It's a living hope. It's not something that is dead. It's not something that is is just a wish. It is something that is certain. It is certain to come. The living hope is guaranteed, it says in our text, by or through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 3 again, cause us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The fact that he rose from the dead grants us or proves to us or gives us this hope. It confirms that the message he preached was true. Uh, you know, we were, we're talking about the kingdom in our Bible study time. The, the Lord Jesus preached the kingdom of God. He preached that it was coming. Uh, he preached, uh, he, he taught the people to anticipate it. The kingdom of God is coming. And indeed, he says, it's among you. He means he's the king. And he also taught that, uh, that those whom he, the Father gave him, he would, they would, no one would pluck them out of his hand. He taught that... Uh, that there was a resurrection to come. This is, a, this is a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It proves or certifies or confirms that the message he preached was true. It proves the immortality of the soul. The fact that he lives again, the same Jesus that died, the same Jesus who rose again, proves the immortality of the soul. And you might say, well, He's God. Of course he's immortal. Yes, but he's also man. And the man, Jesus, rose again. He had the marks in his hands to identify him. The mark in his side to identify him. The man, Jesus, rose again. Our hope, our living hope, is that we, like him, will rise. And it also is a pledge. His resurrection is a pledge against the resurrection of all those who find life in him. In other words, he's like the guarantee. He's the... He is the one thing that proves that if we have our hope in him, that we too will rise. Because he lives, we too will live again. So a living hope, result number one. Result number two, the imperishable inheritance. So we have the idea of inheritance in the Bible. In the Old Testament, the land was described as Israel's inheritance. They were in the wilderness and God promised to give them an inheritance in the land. It would belong to them and to their people. Forever, God says. And indeed, we believe those promises are true for Israel and for the kingdom and for everything that God has said that would happen in the Old Testament. It, that land, it belongs to Israel and it will go to Israel, in a redeemed Israel, in the end of days. But in the New Testament, the son is described as the heir and he inherits when he does all the father sent him to do. 
And you know what's interesting? After the resurrection, Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18, all authority is given to me. He has come into his inheritance. But there's something about his inheritance. He has made us joint heirs with him as children of God. Romans 8, 16 and 17, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. And so we are joint heirs with Christ, or fellow heirs, as it's described here in the in verse 17 of uh, Acts, or Romans 8. So we are part of that inheritance. And then he describes our inheritance in this verse. He uses these terms, imperishable, not subject to corruption or decay. Now, you can get an inheritance in this life. Uh, you can, I've gotten, I think, something from one of my aunts. I think I got a few thousand dollars from her for when she passed away. And uh, that was nice. I appreciated it. Uh, it's gone now. <laughs> it's perished. That inheritance didn't last. It was put to use. And so it has gone. Uh, you can inherit a house and lands and, and estates and so forth. And those inheritances are perishable. Uh, they require maintenance. If you don't take care of them, they'll fall apart. They'll, they'll wo- waste away. And, uh, you know, you, for an inheritance here on earth is perishable. You can spend it all. Uh, some people have such large inheritances, you wonder if they could, but it's amazing the kind of money people can foolishly throw away. And uh, it's, uh, uh, in any case, inheritances here on this earth are perishable. It's also undefiled. Now here the idea is purity without defect and not tainted by our use. So it's obtained, it's not obtained by illicit means, this inheritance. There's nothing questionable about how it came to us. There's nothing uh, that our use of it will taint. What I mean by that, I have a quote here from one of my commentaries. He says, here no one can be heir to an inheritance of gold, uh, gold or houses without danger of soon sinking into indolence, effeminacy, or vice. There, the inheritance may be enjoyed forever, and the soul continually advance in knowledge, holiness, and the active service of God. In the resurrection, we will be redeemed. We will not have the sin nature, and our use of that inheritance which God gives us in that day will be a use that glorifies God and increases our knowledge of him and our ability to serve him. This is an undefiled inheritance. And not only that, we, the term is used that is, is unfading. Unfading. Uh, that will not fade away. Never loses the glory of its possession. When you get a, a, a vase of flower, you get some flowers, somebody gives you some flowers and they come to grace your home. And they, uh, you know, they sit on a vase on the table and they're very beautiful and so forth. They have sometimes a very you have that fresh, some flowers just give out that fresh smell and just a real delight to the soul. And that's wonderful, but they fade away, don't they? They lose their, uh, their zest. They wither away and become nothing. Well, this, this inheritance will not wither away. It will not fade away. And uh, even more striking illustration, I think of uh, our house. You, many of you were at our house today for the picnic, and many of you enjoyed the view that we enjoy at our house. And you know, it's quite a striking view, isn't it? You're sort of breathtaking when you first see it. And uh, we, I remember when we moved into the house, and that was, that's more than, or almost 10 years ago now, or maybe it's a bit more than that, I can't remember. Our granddaughter was born just as we were moving in, and that's how I usually can remember, and I can't remember if she's nine or 10, it's, I'm losing it, but anyway, it's somewhere in there. It'll be either 10 or 11 years this fall. And, you know, when I first moved in there, that view, it was so striking. That's what sold us on the house. In fact, uh, there was another house I would have rather buy, bought. But once my wife saw that view, it was game over. I was, 
I was done for. I wasn't going to buy anywhere else. Well, we, uh, you know, and I would go to that, go in there, and I was, uh, we had at that time, I was working in a, the uh, one room just to the left of the door as you come in. That was sort of my temporary office as I built the office later in the garage. But the, uh, you know, and I'd look out that window and I post pictures and tell my friends, oh, it's hard to concentrate, hard to work and uh, so forth, and it was just breathtaking. You can get up in the morning, look out that window, and it's like, wow, what a, what a view. Well, you know, 10 years in now. Yeah, it's a view. <laughs> the glory has faded. <laughs> I'm so used to it. It's like, ah, you know, yeah, it's a nice view. Now, you might think, how could you get used to a view like that? Well, you can. But I'll tell you something, in heaven, you'll never get used to it. You will be, your inheritance in heaven will be spectacular. And you'll be able to serve God forever. And you'll never get tired of God. You'll never get tired of God. The, the glory will never fade away. It is, it is really something. And that's what he's talking about here. The benefit of our, inher- of our salvation is this inheritance. And it's settled. It says there at the end of verse 4, reserved in heaven for you. It's like it's in a safe deposit box and it's utterly secure. So benefit number one, the living hope. Benefit number two, the, uh, uh, what do we call it? The imperishable inheritance. And then finally, benefit number three, or result number three, ultimate salvation. Now there's a bit of a grammatical change here because we have the first part of verse five is still talking about, it's, it says reserved in heaven for you and then who are protected by the power of God, modifies, it's a description of you. You are the one who's protected by the power of God. And it comes to this result in the middle of the verse, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Future or ultimate salvation. Now this doesn't refer to our salvation now. When you are born again, that's our salvation now. But we are born again for a salvation to be revealed. It refers to our coming salvation when Jesus comes, a final and complete redemption. So the old nature is done away. Our old flesh that is subject to disease, that that grows weary, that is subject to hunger and thirst, and sin is done away with, and our ultimate salvation will come. The complete redemption will come. And that first phrase, which says, who are protected by the power of God, refers to, to being under guard by the power of God. It's like there's a garrison of angels around us, a great protection, and he keeps us for this future salvation. Uh, I was, uh, uh, as a matter of illustration, some years ago when my son Rory was married, after the wedding, we went to London. And we... uh, my mother had insisted that we were going to tour the Tower of London. She had been there years before, and she very much enjoyed the Tower of London, and she insisted. I wasn't all that keen. Oh, I just want to see the British Museum. I don't care about anything else. And No, no, you're going, and I'm paying, as the mother said. And so, okay, we went. And I'm glad we went. It was was interesting. It was worth seeing. A lot of history in that building and and, uh, so forth. Or not a building, it's a complex. And... uh, uh, in that building, it's, you have to go through security to get in the building. You know, they want you to pay, number one, that's the first thing. But uh, there's, so they've got ways to keep you from getting in uh, without paying. That's probably the most important thing. But there's also things inside that they want to keep secure. So they have security all around the perimeter. You can only go in in certain places. You have to go through the tick wickets and all of that uh, bit. And then when you get inside the complex, there's numerous buildings, all kinds of things to see. But there's this one stone block building, old building, where the crown jewels are housed. And you go in there, and uh, there's, uh, as I I think, you can only, so many people can go in at once, and you're going through these various rooms, and there's the crown that Queen Elizabeth wears on occasion with those beautiful jewels in it. And... Uh, they're behind uh, very thick glass, all lit up. I'm sure there's motion sensors. There are cameras. I'm sure somebody's watching you the entire time that you're in there. That is guarded and protected. This is what this verse is saying. Who are protected by the power of God through faith 
for a salvation that is to come, ready to be revealed in the last time. You're protected. You're under guard by the power of God. The garrison of angels is around you. And it says through faith. Now that's a little bit disconcerting there. Does that mean that we are guarded through faith? In other words, if our faith wavers, God says, oh, okay, we'll send a few angels away. Oh, there, man, that guy's done. We're just going to let him expose him to the elements. That's not what it means. We are born again through faith. This is how we get our garrison. This is how we get our guard. And we are, it's not that we are kept through faith. We gain this privilege through faith, initial saving faith. And so the proposition once again, the new birth grants believers three certain results. A living hope, born again to a living hope. An imperishable inheritance, born again to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable. A salvation yet to come, born again for a salvation ready to be revealed, verse 5. Those are the three certain results of being born again. That's quite a passage. Now remember, Peter is writing his epistles with a backdrop of suffering. The very next verse, which we haven't got to yet, Lord willing, next week, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. And so there is this, uh, this surety, this confidence, this hope that we have in God because of the, the, he has caused us to be born again. We have these three certain results. Paul, he is saying this to bolster our courage in the day of trouble. And Paul says something similar. Earlier I quoted from Romans 8, 16 and 17, but here's Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us, or to us. And this is, Peter has described for us something of that glory. These three certain results that we can hope for in him. What a blessing it is to know the Lord and to be his servant. And so I hope that uh, this has been an encouragement to you. And I hope that as you think about the troubles and trials that you face, that you can rest in this and cling to this and look forward to this and wait for the day when the Lord brings about the final redemption. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this passage. We pray that it might stir us up to serve you and love you even more. And we pray that as we uh, go out, that you help us to be a faithful witness and that souls would be saved and your kingdom expanded and others would likewise enjoy this inheritance with the saints. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord bless you.